It was one of those hectic Mondays to start the week, and I was tired as I drove my F-350 down the long, winding road to the house, only to see a black stretch limousine in our circular driveway, right in front of my front door. This was unusual for our home, and I had a bad feeling when I parked the truck. My name is Martin Creed. I'm 42 years old, and I've been married to Justine for the last five wonderful years. You could say that I married above my level. Justine Bautista was a professional dancer, quite famous in dance circles. She owned her own dance studio and was known for working with many stars in both music videos and film choreography. It was quiet when I entered the house, so I called out to let Justine know I was home. I heard a quiet voice from the living room and saw Justine on the sofa, looking into a cup of coffee with her hands folded in her lap. I knew this wouldn't bode well, and I braced myself for an invisible shock wave. Honey, is everything okay? Why is there a limousine in our driveway? She did not look at me, and, lowering her head, said those words that you only read about and hoped to never hear from your loved one. Honey, something happened. We need to talk. Now, before I tell you about this scene, let me introduce myself. As I mentioned, I'm Martin Creed, Marty to Friends. I am the president of Coastal Construction, the largest commercial builder in South Florida. Coastal Construction was founded by my dear old dad in 1947, who is now semi-retired but still owns 100% of the company. I will be the sole heir to the company and legacy, as stated in his will and power of attorney. Until then, I run things while dad enjoys his days fishing and golfing. If such a thing existed, many would call me an alpha male, a cliche I don't like. You know, I'm actually a gentle giant. I'm six foot ten and muscular thanks to good genes and over 20 years of hard work from my father. My father made me learn business from the ground up and taught me the meaning of a hard day's work. It was really hard work and he treated me no differently than any other employee. He was determined to toughen me up, and after I suffered several concussions, several broken bones, and many other injuries, I learned the value of a hard day's work. I also learned the value of honesty and integrity after making some early mistakes. My father's corrections were quick and painful. When I was young, I once treated my younger sister badly and responded rudely to my mother. I still remember the painful lesson my father taught me for my bad behavior. From an early age, my father taught me never to humiliate women, since they are God's gift to the male race and the mother of our children. I was expected to be polite and respectful. Thanks to the lessons of those early years, I protected my sister and friends in an overzealous manner. I treasured them and treated women like delicate flowers. I have always trusted and respected them because I believed they were here to honor us and raise our family. Old-fashioned? Perhaps. But that's how I was raised. I never started a fight, but my size intimidated many people, which ended the matter before I had to hurt anyone. I've never actually been in a real fight, but I've stopped so many that I stopped counting. My attitude towards women carried over into adulthood where I continued to treat them like precious treasures and pampered them like crazy. However, in bed I was not gentle, but showed strong sexual desires, probably due to excess testosterone. Women loved my anatomically correct body and enjoyed my strong, large masculinity. I have never had any complaints about my ability to make love, but there have been many occasions when my partner has told me that he wishes I were more loving and affectionate. I tried, but it always came out insincere, since my main instinct was simply to passionately possess my partner. I've been told that sex with me was like an hour at Space Mountain at Disneyland. Stormy, exciting, scary, and fun. Unfortunately, I never learned the soft lovemaking that some girls desire. I met Justine while doing construction work on her building. We weren't exactly what anyone would call a match, as she was 5 feet 5 inches tall and weighed 115 pounds. She was fragile, with long legs, slender, and feminine. She was always dressed in her dance outfits, which emphasized her sexuality and femininity. In general, she was every guy's dream. There was no way I would ever have considered myself as a potential partner for such a diverse woman, but it happened. We had chemistry when we met, and we immediately started flirting and getting along better than I could have imagined. It took a long time before I got up the courage to ask her out, 
but after she asked me why I was so shy, I asked her out for coffee. Soon after that, we started dating and became a couple. We were a great couple, got along great, and enjoyed our free time together. She loved our sexual roller coaster and said that all the men she had been with before were much less aggressive. They were loving and affectionate, but she explained that the girl loved a strong man and the exciting sex we shared. She was a rock star under the covers, and I had some of the best sexual moments of my life with this fragile little flower. The big builder and the frail dancer made an interesting couple when we got married a year after we met. She loved being surrounded by the performing arts, both acting and dancing. She was adopted at birth by Carlos and Maria Bautista, a Cuban couple in Miami, and raised lovingly in Spanish culture. Hispanic fathers treated their daughters like princesses. Cuban men are known for their machismo and strength. However, because of her love of dancing, most of the guys she hung out with were anything but macho. Most male dancers and actors were handsome or gay. These guys were all obsessed with their appearance and self-esteem. Justine developed a passion for modern dance, salsa, and rumba, and won numerous awards throughout her studies. She graduated with a degree in dance, and her parents opened a dance studio for her in Coral Gables so she could become famous. Her dance studio quickly became successful, largely due to her skills, reputation, love of the arts, and family connections. South Florida is known for movies, music videos, and international modeling shows. Justine's talent and beauty attracted many clients, and her clients were now attracting some of the world's most famous talents. People like Taylor Swift, Camila Cabello, and Ariana Grande were her students. Her studio received national recognition, and Justine won numerous American and Latin American dance awards and became the dance destination in Miami. Pierre Laurent was the hottest male dancer in the country and was known as a ladies' man. With his expensive lifestyle, fame, and looks, he was every girl's dream. With his long hair, he was a national star. The tabloids always published photographs of him, showing off his long, shoulder-length hair, which became his trademark. He was tall, thin, and also handsome, and women found his long hair so sexy. His reputation among women was always mentioned in interviews on television or in the press and was constantly photographed with supermodels and famous actresses. He was also accused of breaking up several marriages in Hollywood. The tabloids interviewed women he dated who always admired his good looks and sexy hair. When Justine had just won her latest award, Pierre happened to be in Miami and stopped by her studio to meet her in person. He felt that someone as important as him should introduce himself to this sexy woman whom he found sensual and desirable. He had been obsessed with her since the last time he saw her at the awards show in that sexy white dress and knew she would be his. After he ensnared Justine, they became engaged and became a happy couple until Justine caught him in bed with one of the other dancers. The tabloids loved the story and Justine became famous because of his scam. She was angry that she had fallen so deeply in love with this bastard and seething with anger that he had broken her heart. Justine broke off the engagement and hasn't spoken to him since. In the beginning, Justine fell in love with all the fame and spotlights that surrounded them as a couple. When she gave herself to him, she thought they would be together forever. She loved him deeply, but after his betrayal, she was broken and suffered from depression for over a year. Her father was furious and wanted to kill the man who hurt his little girl. But he was convinced to calm down and give him some time before he did something he would regret. It was a year after Pierre left Justine when she met Martin, or Marty as she liked to call him. He was completely different from any other man she had ever been with. Martin was big and strong, rough to the touch, but kind and polite. He hadn't had a $200 haircut and probably hadn't shaved in days. He was the complete opposite of every guy she had ever been with or dated. She was frustrated that her flirting and attempts to get him to ask her out were failing, and she ended up confronting him before he left the new building they were adding to the studio. Marty, can I talk to you for a minute? Of course, Justine. How can I help you? I asked around and know that you are single and not dating anyone. I'm wondering why you didn't ask me out after I gave you so many signals. Don't you like me or have I offended you in some way? Shocked to the core, he stood in front of her for a long moment, with his mouth open, 
and finally spoke. Are you kidding me? You're the sexiest woman I've ever seen, and I'm sure every guy who works for me would kill to ask you out on a date. Then why didn't you invite me? Well, two reasons. First, you are my client, and it would be unprofessional. But the real reason is that you are so much above my level that I could not even dream that you would accept an invitation from someone like me. Her laugh shocked him even more and made him want to run back to his truck. You are a big fool. You are someone who is above my level. You treat me so delicately and kindly and don't try to woo me like every other guy I know. And I find you extremely attractive and sexy, not at all like assholes that I talk to every day. I want you to take me out on a date and whatever we do, I promise I'll enjoy doing it with you. This day led to a two-year relationship that ended in marriage. Justine was fascinated by Martin and the way he lived. No pretenses, fake relationships, or boasting. What she saw was a powerful man who loved and respected women. As tender as Martin was towards her, he was the complete opposite in bed. His sexual activity was powerful and wild. One night in bed, Martin made the mistake of asking about her previous lovers and he stood up. She told him that she only had one person to compare him to, and when she compared her sex with Martin to Pierre, it was like heaven and earth. She told him that Pierre only cared about Pierre and never made love to her like Martin. Deep down, she was always pleased and loved Martin's enthusiasm, but sometimes she missed Pierre's tenderness. She was madly in love with Martin, and they made love almost every night, and after five years of marriage, things were going great. Her studio was making a profit, and now her younger sister was running things. Carmela followed in her sister's footsteps and was Justine's trusted partner in the studio. Carmela didn't have Justine's natural talents, but she was just as attractive and outgoing as Justine, only now five years younger and full of energy. Martin was now the president of the company, and his father was aging. He was ready to take over the company with his father's blessing. The father was now 92 years old and knew he would not live much longer and commissioned a lawyer to prepare plans for the inevitable change of ownership. Both businesses were highly successful, so both attorneys recommended prenuptial agreements for both parties before they got married. Neither Justine nor Martin cared about this and agreed with their lawyer's recommendations. Justine was madly in love with Martin as he continued to treat her as his queen by day and his harlot by night. They both enjoyed their lives and, despite their physical differences, were the perfect couple. Justine continued to wear her sexy dance outfits most of the time, and every time Marty saw her slim, sexy body in those clothes, it drove him crazy with passion. She knew what she was doing and enjoyed teasing and pleasing her big man. A few years ago, we shared our entire story, and we both had similar experiences. Mary Jo cheated on me with one of my good friends and broke my heart. I explained how much I hate cheaters and that any relationship I enter into will be exclusive. She knew my past and my jealous streak and promised that she would never give me a reason to be jealous. We both understood the pain of a cheating partner and made promises never to cheat before we got married. We wrote our vows together, and we both agreed to live them with all our hearts. It was five years ago, and our marriage was strong, and we decided to start planning a family and move on to the next stage of our lives. Justine was at the point where the studio had good dancers to keep it going, and I was making enough that we didn't need her income. But she was in love with her dance studio and its success. We were discussing how she could begin to hand over control to Margaret, her lead dance instructor, when something seemed different. One night, Justine explained that she wanted to wait six months before we started having children so she could negotiate a new contract with the film studio, and she didn't think Margaret could handle the negotiations. She explained that it would take a couple of months to finalize the contract and then a few more months to make sure everything was in place. It was a great opportunity, and of course I agreed. During these months, she had to work late and spend a couple of nights a week in Hollywood and working with the studio. We didn't have much time together during this time, and this affected our sex life, which has now been reduced to once or twice a week. She promised that after completing this project, she would shake up my world and everything would go back to normal. When she was busy with a project, she became more distant than usual. But I gave her space, knowing that it would end soon. I continued to treat her like a queen, 
and gave her as much space as she needed. With the remaining couple of months, I tried to be understanding until that night I came home and saw a limousine in front of our house. When I entered the house, I saw Justine on the sofa, dressed in business casual, which was not her custom. Like I said, she usually wore her sexy dance outfits or sweatpants around the house because she knew how it affected me. She looked sullen today, and I knew something was up. I sat next to her on the couch, and she took my hands in hers and apologized without even starting a conversation. I felt anxious and weak when she started talking. Honey, I'm sorry it's so sudden, but it was last minute. I got a call this morning, and I didn't want to tell you on the phone. You know, all the work we've done with pop stars, and now Shakira and Selena Gomez are getting performance awards at Cannes this week. MGM wants me there to be part of the event and announce our new partnership. It's all part of a business deal I've been working on for the last six months. It all happened so quickly, and now I need to fly out for a few days and finally get a contract with a movie studio. This will mean over $5 million in contracts for the next year, and from there, our studio will get a lot more business from other stars. So you're leaving me to fly to Cannes alone to be with all these stars? Yes, but it's only for a few days, and you know you have no reason to worry. I love you, and this will all be over before you know it. I've worked so hard for this, and I'm finally at the finish line. Please, don't be upset. Justine, I never told you how to run your business, and I didn't complain about your days in Hollywood, but I have a bad feeling about this trip. I'd rather you didn't leave and stayed here with me. We don't need a contract or money. Please don't go on this trip. With a sad smile, she said, Marty, I love you, but this has been my goal for years. Please don't be upset and trust me. I will be fine and back in your arms in just a few days. Knowing that she was about to leave and feeling defeated, I asked, What is your route? What airline are you on? I left the hotel information on the table, but I'm flying on a private jet, so I don't have a schedule yet. Private jet? Wow. Is this from a movie studio? She thought for a second and decided to tell the truth, as always. No, this is Pierre's plane. The studio said that he has an open seat, and since he will be participating in the award ceremony, we should fly together. I didn't know what to say as my jealousy began to rise along with my anger. She must have seen the pain and hurt on my face and tried to hug me, but I just stood up and left the room, walked out to my truck and drove away without saying goodbye. In my heart of hearts, I did not think that I had any reason to worry, but remembering the last few months and her behavior, and now leaving with Pierre without warning, I was overcome with jealousy and suspicion. Justine left the house in tears, knowing that Martin was suffering. She knew there was no easy way to tell him about this award ceremony and the need to be there with Pierre. She just prayed that he would let her go, make a contract, and trust her. As she rode in the limousine, she cried, feeling guilty about leaving in such a way. She realized that not explaining it correctly and not telling Martin that flying to France with Pierre was wrong and hoped that he would never ask or find out. She knew it was stupid to think, damn, this didn't go well. I knew when they called me at noon and gave me five hours to get ready that it was going to be a bad day. The problem in this business is that you don't have control especially when you're trying to land a contract with one of the biggest studios in Hollywood. I didn't expect Martin to understand, but I prayed that he would be reasonable. Seeing him leave in anger, I wanted to stay and take away his pain, but I, I had to leave. Too many people relied on me, and this was my lifelong dream. He should have understood and trusted me. The worst part was on the flight. I can't believe my flight was on Pierre's private jet. I didn't intend to be with him. When I told Martin that it was Pierre's plane, I realized that I had unintentionally plunged a knife into his poor heart. As we approached the private airport, I took out my phone and sent him a message after he didn't answer my calls. Then I realized how angry he was. He always answered my calls. Marty, I love you, and I know you trust me. I had no choice but to go on this trip to make this contract and I hope you love me enough to understand. Please don't be jealous and don't think that I would ever do anything to hurt you. I'm sorry I didn't tell you about Pierre's plane, but he was involved in the studio and contracts, and it was arranged without my knowledge. You know what I think about him, and you have no reason to worry. Please don't be jealous or angry. 
He means absolutely nothing to me, and I hope you know that. Please answer your phone when I call you later. It's so hard for me to leave like this, and I need to hear you say that you love me and that everything is fine with us. Please. I love you, darling. Last minute, oh well. Pierre's plain, and she didn't tell me. It smells rotten. It's Mary Jo all over again, but this time I won't be silent. Stop calling me, honey. I won't answer your damn calls when you leave like this. Yes, maybe I'm acting immature and shouldn't be jealous, but after the way she's acted since the beginning of this project and the fact that she hasn't told me about Pierre, it just doesn't seem right. And I've learned to trust my instincts, and now they're telling me there's cause for concern. I stopped at a weird club and read her text while on my second drink at the bar. My anger had subsided a little by then, and I tried to believe that it was just something sudden. Her calls continued, but I did not answer. Then I received her text message. After reading it, I tried to be understanding and realized that I had no choice but to trust her and wait for her return. I wasn't happy, but I couldn't control the situation. Even after reading her heartfelt text, I still acted like a child and didn't answer her calls or text messages. Since I had never missed her calls or texts before, she must have known that I was angry. Later that night when I got home, her sister Carmela called and tried to calm me down. Hey Carmela, what's wrong? I answered. Hey big brother. Justine says she messed up and feels terrible. I want you to know that she cried and felt guilty when she left today. But trust me, none of us knew about it until this afternoon. If we wanted this contract, she had to leave. She had no choice. Nothing was planned in advance, and she did not know that she would fly with Pierre until this call. Marty, she loves you, and nothing is happening. You will be okay? Do you need me to come? Thanks for calling, honey. I'll be fine. I'm just upset with the way she's been acting for the last six months, and it seems a little too random that she left this way to fly with Pierre to France without notice. I feel like a fool for letting this happen, and I don't know what I'll do. What do you mean? What are you going to do? I don't know. For some reason, I believe I was set up, and if you know me at all, you know I'm not the kind of person who would put up with that. I won't talk to her until she comes back. And then I'll decide what to do next. Marty, stop it. Nothing is happening. It's just a business deal, and everything will be back to normal next week. Just a business deal? A last-minute trip to France with her ex-fiancé on his private jet for a few nights in the same hotel? Yeah, nothing happens, of course. Marty, where are you? You're having dinner with me tonight. Carmela was an exact copy of her sister, only a few inches taller. She didn't have the same artistic talents as Justine, but she was very smart, had a master's degree in finance, and was a certified public accountant. She managed Justine's business and finances and helped manage the day-to-day -day operations when Justine was away. She was several years younger than her sister. Carmela was equally sexy and attractive, and we quickly became close when I became her brother-in-law. There was never anything sexual between us since I was completely devoted to Justine and only had eyes for her. But if I was honest, when I saw her walking into the restaurant in that tight dress and long legs, it was the first time I saw her in a new light. I quickly pushed the thought aside and had a pleasant dinner. When we finished, Carmela convinced me that I was being emotional and told me to just relax and trust Justine. She said she would have known if something was going on, but the only thing that was more important to Justine than her business was me, her husband. Carmela told me how much her sister loved me and that she had never seen her so happy. I listened and felt much better, but deep down my instincts were still wary. At least the drinks, dinner and company calmed my nerves and I was able to sleep well after turning off my cell phone. Because of the way she left, I still had no intention of talking to her until she returned and continued to ignore her calls and text messages. Celine, my assistant for the last five years, was close to me and an integral part of my daily life. She was from Montreal and spoke fluent French, which gave me an idea of what I could do. The next morning, as soon as she arrived, I told her the whole story and said that maybe I was being a jerk, but I had a bad feeling about their trip. I asked her to find the best detective agency in Cannes and immediately organize surveillance. 
They would have charged more money for rush work, but I was more than happy to pay. I made it clear that I wanted this to be a priority and was willing to pay extra for immediate monitoring. Of course, they already knew Pierre from his fame and past adventures. This combined with photos of my wife and the hotel they were staying at made their task easier. They were instructed to immediately send me any photos that might interest me, and I wanted 24-hour surveillance along with a full report of their daily activity. Before I even woke up the next morning, there were 12 photos on my phone, and to my utter disappointment, I knew my fears were justified. Photos showed them together, with his arm around hers, and several of them hugging awards and stars. The last image was of him holding her hand as he entered the hotel. I may have acted out of jealousy and acted immature, but my jealousy was now in control and I acted immediately. I asked Celine to book the next flight to Cannes, returning the next day. I didn't need a hotel since I was only going to be there for less than 24 hours. I was going to end this somehow. I didn't have a plan yet, but I had to come up with something on the flight across the Atlantic Ocean. She found a direct flight that departed that evening and arrived at 5.45 a.m. the next morning. I asked her to book business class so I could rest when I got there because I needed to be prepared when I encountered them. The detective agency sent me their room number, which turned out to be a two-room suite. I prayed that what she told me was true and they weren't together. If she had just kissed him and shared some small intimacy, then maybe I could forgive that and stop everything else that could happen. I loved her and had to try to save our marriage. Flying business class and with no luggage, I quickly made it through customs. Since today was our anniversary, I had the taxi stop at U Express, where I bought a dozen roses and five individual roses, one rose for each year, it was our tradition, a COVID face mask, and large scissors. We set off and arrived at the hotel by 8.20 a.m. In Cannes, during the awards, people party until late in the morning, so I knew that the couple would still be in their room, either sleeping or just waking up. At this point, everything was going according to plan, and my intentions were starting to take shape. Before I got out of the taxi, I put on my mask, pulled the hood over my head, took the flowers with the scissors in my pocket, and headed towards the main entrance of the hotel. My plan was simple, not sophisticated, but it would satisfy my anger. My plan was to walk through the lobby posing as a flower delivery guy and head up to the ninth floor to suite 945. Then I was going to knock on the door with the flowers. I knew that he would open the door since they had no reason to suspect that I might visit them. If they were together, I was going to beat Pierre up and cut off his famous long hair. If she hadn't been there, I would have knocked on her door and surprised her with my anniversary gift and rejoiced at her loyalty. Simple and stupid, but if he had sex with my wife, I knew my plan would be a big blow to him and his image. However, my plans changed in an instant. As I walked towards the main entrance of the hotel, my phone beeped indicating a new text message. Pierre got up early while Justine was still sleeping in his bed. He planned to go downstairs for a walk and then bring the coffee back to his room. He dressed quietly, seeing his beautiful Justine on the bed with her left hand on her hip. Seeing her wedding ring next to her naked pussy, he acted on a stupid impulse and did something he would regret for the rest of his life. Pierre saw Justine's phone on the nightstand and, using facial recognition to unlock it, took a photo of Justine with her wedding ring in plain sight. Knowing that her husband, Martin, was in another country and unattainable, Pierre had an irresistible desire to let her jealous husband know that his ideal wife was now his woman. Over the past month, no matter how hard he tried to get her into bed, she told him about her love for Martin and their wonderful marriage. Justine made it clear that she would never be with another man, especially not after what he did to her last time. She told Pierre to stop trying to seduce her and that their relationship was strictly business. His ego took over, and that's when he made a fatal mistake. After he took a photo of her, he opened the messaging app, found Martin's name, and typed a message. Hey, big guy. Your wife is having a great time. Too bad you don't see us in action. 
I think I'll leave her here with me for a while. He then attached a photo and clicked send. Martin was about to press the elevator call button when the message came. Seeing that it was from Justine, he stopped and opened the text to see the woman he loved naked on the bed. Then he read the message and his world collapsed. Standing frozen with roses in his hands and looking at the photo and message, a new hatred arose in his head. Having come to his senses, he walked up to the elevator and forcefully pressed the call button to confront this predator and cause destruction. His plans had now changed, and he was going to kill the bastard. Apart from this message, everything was going in his favor, and subsequent events unfolded perfectly. It was as if all the planets were lined up in a row and everything was going as well as possible. When he entered the hotel, the lobby was empty and silent. Then, after he pressed the elevator button, the door opened, and to Martin's surprise, Pierre came out of the elevator, the same man who had just cuckolded him, taking his wife and ruining his happy marriage. Time seemed to slow down, and for several long seconds Martin relieved the pain of Mary Jo's infidelity all those years ago and the sight of his naked wife, a photo of whom this man had maliciously sent to his phone less than two minutes ago. A dark cloud of pain and anger now enveloped Martin as the scene unfolded. Martin instantly recognized the man with long hair and did not allow him to leave the elevator. He stood in front of him and pushed him back inside. Pierre, being a head shorter, had no choice but to retreat into the elevator and began to object. In a firm voice, he told the hooded man holding the flowers to get out of the way. But even before the noisy doors had closed, Martin sprang into action. Pierre, still dazed from a night of partying, did not recognize the masked and hooded man with the flowers and continued to shout at him for not allowing him to exit the elevator. Operating on a high level of adrenaline, Martin instantly grabbed Pierre by his long hair and slammed his face into the steel wall of the elevator, knocking him unconscious. The old elevator moved slowly, and luckily for Martin, the elevator didn't stop during his vengeful ride to the ninth floor. He placed the roses on top of Pierre and exited the elevator as the doors opened on the ninth floor. All this happened in less than a minute. Reality rushed back into him, and he realized what he had just done. He exited the elevator and saw the exit sign for the stairs at the end of the corridor and quickly went down into the hall. While all this was happening, Justine woke up and was confused as to why she was naked and alone and wondered why she was in Pierre's bed. Then she remembered him trying to persuade her to spend the evening with him, but she couldn't understand why. She would never let him touch her like that and told him so several times. She remembered how blurry everything was and tried to remember what happened, but could only remember sex. This sent her into another panic attack. Did she do this last night? Nothing made sense. Then she remembered the glass of champagne he had given her while he was trying to talk her into all of this. They celebrated the contract by drinking a toast to their success. Did he really put something on her? She would never do this. She loved her husband and would never do anything to hurt him or ruin their marriage. And she knew how he felt about infidelity. Realizing what had happened and overcome with guilt, she felt the need to contact Martin. Her guilt overcame all other feelings and she needed to talk to him. When she opened her phone and saw an open text message, her heart stopped. She saw the photo and read the message that was sent to Martin, the man she loved and wanted to start a family with. After seeing the photos and reading the words, she screamed. Anger coursed through her blood and she wanted to punish Pierre for ruining her marriage. She knew Martin was too manly to take her back after that, and she immediately went into crisis mode. Realizing what he had done, she became angry with Pierre and knew she had to save her marriage. She was going to file charges against Pierre to prove to Martin that this was not her will. Because of his fame, he probably would have gotten away with it. But she had to do something. She didn't shower and just put on some clothes, wanting to get out of the room before Pierre returned. She pressed the elevator button to go to the police station and file a report. When the elevator doors opened, the first thing she saw were roses and then Pierre, unconscious on the floor. 
While she was trying to understand what was in front of her, she counted the roses and realized that there were 17 of them, exactly the same number that Martin would have given her for their anniversary, which she suddenly realized was on that very day. In complete panic, she wondered if Martin was here and did this to Pierre. When the doors reached the hall, she ran out of the elevator, screaming, Call an ambulance! Something happened to that person in the elevator! And she ran out of the main entrance. When she reached the street, she saw a tall man getting into a taxi and was sure it was Martin. Still in shock, she ran down the street, screaming for the taxi to stop. This is where tragedy struck, as if the gods were against her that day. As she ran to the taxi, a young girl, riding too fast on her electric scooter, crashed straight into Justine before she could break. Unfortunately, the impact caused Justine to spin around and end up clumsily pinned against the hydrant, causing her leg injury. The blow came with full force, tearing tendons and dislocating his right knee. She lost consciousness from pain and woke up an hour later in the hospital, where she told doctors what had happened to her and demanded that the police be called. Of course, the paparazzi were standing outside the hotel, expecting something like this to happen, and quickly took photos of Justine running out of the hotel, the accident, and photos of Pierre leaving the hotel. The news will talk about Pierre's affair with Justine and the attack of the deceived husband. The studio will love the press, but the betrayed husband and family will be devastated by the article appearing on television around the world. This became the story of the week. At the hospital, the police took her statement, and when she finished, the police asked if she knew that Pierre, the man she accused of rape, was in a hospital room several floors below, recovering from a concussion. When she heard about Pierre, she just stared at the policeman with a shocked face and asked him what happened. She knew that the only person who could be so evil and do such a thing was Martin, but he was in the USA, wasn't he? Or was it him getting into a taxi? Her head was spinning and tears flowed from her eyes from pain and fear of losing her husband. Mrs. Creed, do you know anything about this attack? Do you know who could have done this? There was no way she could mention Martin and just shook her head in denial. The officer then looked at her with contempt and asked a question that made her fall back onto the bed. Mrs. Creed, the information we have about you says that you are married. Does your husband know about your relationship with Pierre? There is no connection. Mrs. Creed, we have all seen the newspapers. You are quoted as saying that Pierre was your lover. Do you deny that? Oh, my God. I never said this and I never talked to the newspapers. God, he is not my lover. This is terrible. How could they lie like that? My husband will never believe me now. She sobbed and sobbed as they watched it as it fell apart. Okay, we'll log your statement and have the nurse check you when we leave. But pictures of you and Pierre were all over the papers, and they were reporting your renewed relationship with him. So yes, we accept your statement. We'll check your blood for illegal substances. But you must understand our position and situation. You are not with your husband and are staying with another person in the same room. How can we contact your husband? We would like to talk to him. He's in America, and it has nothing to do with all this, and I don't want him to find out. So I won't give you his information right now. I want to wait for the test results. Maybe then you'll believe me and bring charges against this bastard who tried to ruin my life. Then the doctor came in and, seeing how upset Justine was at the moment, asked the policeman to leave the room. The doctor took her hand and tried to calm her down. Mrs. Creed, you have a serious knee injury and will require surgery. We can schedule surgery here if you prefer, or we can stabilize your leg so you can fly back to the U.S. if you prefer. But you will need to take care of this before further damage is done. Just as she was angry about her injury, she was devastated that Martin saw the photo and the words Pierre wrote. She wondered if Martin had seen any of these reports in the newspapers about her and Pierre. She was sure he would never understand. When she tried to call Martin, he still did not answer her calls. She began to panic and realized that she was now alone. She called her father and asked him for help. She explained what happened and that Martin was not answering her calls and about the photo Pierre had sent. Her father was furious and expressed his outrage to his daughter over the phone. How could you do this to Martin? 
And why would you even consider talking to that idiot Pierre after what he did to you? Baby, I don't even know how angry I am or how much you disappointed me, but I'll send you away. Home as soon as possible and make an appointment with the surgeon as soon as you get back. I'll talk to your doctor and get everything sorted out. I'll call Martin and see what he thinks. But as far as I know him, you could have lost this man. What? What the hell were you thinking? Dad, this was my chance to make a career. Just a three-day trip to show off and sign contracts. I had no intention of being with that bastard again, but the studio arranged everything without my knowledge. I found out about it at the last minute and I would never have taken that flight if I had a choice. I should have known that bastard would ruin my life again. I should never have gone. Dad, you have to believe me. I didn't do anything voluntarily. That bastard slipped something on me and I need to talk to Martin. He saw this photo and I know he will never understand. I'll call him baby try to relax. What he did wasn't your fault. And I'll try to explain to Martin. You don't have to talk to Martin until I try to explain what happened. We'll put you on a flight to New York tomorrow morning and the next day you will have surgery at NYU. You will be sedated and unable to talk to Martin right now. I just need you to relax and let me take care of you. Two floors below Justine, Pierre realized what had happened and wanted to find the attacker. He was upset and angry about his attack and demanded that the police find his attacker. All he could tell them was that he saw a large man grab his hair and then nothing but darkness. For all the trouble Pierre had caused the police over the years, they had no sympathy for him. Justine's surgery went well, but the damage was severe and she had a long recovery ahead. After many months of physical therapy and a lot of pain, she was able to walk without crutches or a cane, although with a slight limp. Doctors said full recovery was possible, but would require another year of exercise and physical therapy. Carlos, her father, did talk to Martin, but was unable to convince him. When Martin showed him the photo and text, his father understood Martin's feelings. Carlos, I respect you and your love for your daughter, but look, she wanted it, and she treated me badly for the last six months. No, it was planned and she still went on the trip, even when I asked her not to go. It was her wish, and I can't help thinking about what happened in that room between them. Maybe she was on some illegal substances. I understand that. But if she hadn't gone, none of this would have happened. I just can't be with her right now and I've already started the separation process. If we can't work this out, we'll divorce in a year. I still love her, but I can't trust her and I can't get rid of the image of her on his bed in my head. Marty, you never admitted to attacking Pierre. I know it was you, even if you don't admit it, and I will never tell anyone. Doesn't that give you any satisfaction? Martin, please try to find a way to forgive her. I'm telling you, she never wanted this to happen. Martin could not overcome what happened and filed for divorce. Even before Justine could return to Miami, Martin had already moved out of their home and into an apartment overlooking Biscayne Bay. He took what he wanted with him and left Justine's house and furniture, along with the partition papers, when she returned from the hospital. He had no intention of talking to Justine. What he saw and knew was more than enough for him to rationalize his actions. On the day he moved out, he left a letter, photos of her and Pierre together, along with his wedding ring and lawyer's contact information. He left her a letter. We both need time to heal. I understand what happened and I am sorry for your pain and situation. But you made your own choices that led to these events and now you will have to live with the results of your decisions. We both know you should never have been alone with him in his hotel room. There was no reason to celebrate your success with him alone in his bedroom. I told you that I had a bad feeling about the trip and told you to stay home, but you went on this trip against my will and without thinking about the consequences. The separation agreement I left with you gives us a year to heal and decide our future. If you want to finalize this sooner, let my lawyer know, and I will ask my lawyer to expedite the divorce process. I really love you, which makes it even more painful since I never thought I'd see you with another man. Yes. I know you were deceived, but this photo shows you so happy in his bed. I just can't get it out of my head. I should delete this photo, but every time I think about calling you or trying to work things out, I force myself to look at you in his bed, and then all the pain comes back and why we are separated.
I'm not ready to talk to you, so if you need anything, please contact my lawyer. His business card is attached to the documents, and you will be financially secure during our section. I will try my best to forgive, forget, and overcome all this damn pain. Martin. Everything he said was true, and now I've lost him. He's right. I should never have been alone in a hotel room with Pierre. My ego led me to believe that I was smart and in control. But now I know how stupid and gullible I was. He knows I would never cheat on him, but that photo of me in his bed must have really hurt him. I can't imagine what it must have been like for him to see me like this. And I will never forgive Pierre for this. Worst of all, he was never arrested and is still at large. At least he felt some pain from Marty's attack. I'll have Martin to thank for that if he ever talks to me again. I'll give it time, but I'm not giving up. I know he loves me, and if I can get him to talk to me, I know he will take me back. I thought that a contract with Hollywood would be the peak of my success, but it turned out to be completely different. If I had just stayed home and given up on this dream, none of this would have happened. I wouldn't be injured, Pierre would be a distant memory, and I'd be back in bed with my husband. Now all I have is pain, loneliness, and regret. I want my pain to go away and my tears to stop flowing but every morning they come back. I want my husband and my life back, and I won't give up. I will keep trying to contact him until he finally picks up the phone and talks to me. The French police were angry and humiliated by all the press and how the attacker escaped. Sure, the hotel's security cameras captured the big man entering the hotel, but the COVID hood and mask the attacker was wearing made him unrecognizable. Ultimately, there was no direct evidence linking Martin to the attack, but the record of his air travel, along with the motive due to his wife's affair, were strong circumstantial evidence that they believed was sufficient to convict Martin Creed. Their problem was that Martin was back in the U.S., and they needed to get him extradited to France to face charges. But Carlos, Justine's father, would not allow this to happen and used his connections and money to get the lawyers to stop the extradition. Carlos hated Pierre as much as Martin did, and wanted Martin to stay safe and perhaps make peace with his daughter. The only downside for Martin was that he was not allowed to visit France for the next seven years without risking arrest. Martin was more than happy with this condition, because he had no desire to visit this country again. He was glad that he survived the situation, and thanked Carlos warmly promising to keep hope for their reconciliation. Three months later, when the story first came out, Pierre's fans had sympathy, but his deceitful ways were revealed, along with details of all the marriages he had ruined. As a result, he became an outcast, Justine became a Jezebel, and Martin became a victim. Justine now lived alone in her large house, she lost her contract with MGM Studios due to all the negative press. The injury from the accident limited her dancing and affected her teaching. In addition, her business suffered from the publicity of her infidelity to her husband. She became just a shadow of her former self. Depressed and lonely, she desperately tried to get Martin to return home and end the separation agreement. She lost count of the number of teams she called and apologized on his answering Machini and the hundreds of text messages begging for his forgiveness. Her father even had several conversations with Martin, but deep down he understood his decision to spend some time apart. He respected Martin and simply hoped for reconciliation. Over the next year, Martin took over his father's company and spent 12, 14 hours a day working and growing the business his father had started. The father is now retired and at 93 was enjoying time with his 89-year-old wife, Millie. After being alone all year, Martin finally accepted that Justine was a victim, and he wanted to find a way to bring her back into his life. He missed her laughter, smile, touches, and tender kisses. He still loved her deeply and wanted her back in his life. Yes, she had gone on the trip against his wishes, and that still made him angry because if she had listened to him, they would still be together. But deep down, he knew that she would never change to him. He wanted to see her again, and she happily agreed to meet for dinner the following Friday at Mario's Garden, their favorite restaurant. Oddly enough, it coincided with the night of their anniversary. 
In a month, they were to separate for a year, and the divorce would become final. Martin needed this one meeting to see if there was a chance of reconciliation and a future together. Martin arrived early with 18 roses, met the owner, Mario Carducci, and explained his situation. He told Mario that this evening could be the beginning of their life together again. He explained that it was their anniversary, and if all went well, he would like Mario to deliver Justine's roses after giving him a sign after dinner. Mario, being the romantic he is, loved the idea, and was all for helping his old friend and regular customer. At 20 Cassin he saw Justine entering the restaurant. His heart pounded in his chest as he saw the woman he still loved for the first time in a year and realized how much he missed her. He noticed her slight limp due to the accident, but quickly looked into her eyes and wrapped his arms around her small body in a strong, overwhelming hug that lasted over a minute. Justine looked at him with tears in her eyes as they walked towards their table. Over two bottles of wine, they both expressed their regret about what had happened, and by the end of the dinner, they realized that they were destined to be together. The dinner was supposed to be the last meeting to discuss their future, but neither of them knew how it would end, but they hoped for the best. The best outcome was to forget the past year and start again. Justine gave Martin a strange look as he waved to Mario, who had been circling their table all night. A moment later, Mario walked over with the roses, handing them to Justine. Happy anniversary, Justine. I missed you so much, and I want you back in my life. Justine began to cry as nearby tables watched. With her head in her hands and sobbing, Martin walked over and lifted her from her chair, kissing her deeply, as other guests in the restaurant applauded and several women let out quiet moans. It was a romantic love scene that many of them will never forget. After Justine came to her senses and released Martin from her tight embrace, they went to the bar for an after-dinner drink. They kissed and cuddled at the bar for more than an hour, and she agreed to return to his apartment that night to start over. It was the happiest time for both of them since that terrible trip to France. But now they knew that they could weather the storm and be together forever. Justine's depression went away, and Martin smiled for the first time in a year. All he wanted was to hold Justine and love the woman he adored so much and missed so much. As they were leaving the restaurant holding hands, a man in a raincoat approached them and almost deliberately bumped into them. Martin, towering over the man, gave him an angry look until he saw the chrome pistol. A second later, he heard a loud sound before he woke up in the hospital after surgery. Over the past year, Pierre has been filled with hatred and needed revenge for how Martin ruined his life. He couldn't cope with the fact that he was ridiculed in public, rejected by all women, and he could no longer find a job. The humiliation was more than he could bear, and he hired a private detective to obtain information about Martin. When he learned about their dinner, he launched his plan. Getting a gun on the streets was easy. Waiting outside the restaurant was exciting as he was about to take revenge. When he saw them walking out together, he lined up perfectly and slammed into the big man, forcing him to stop. He saw the evil look of the man he was about to take revenge on. Pierre looked into his eyes until he was sure Martin recognized him and then fired, hitting him straight in the stomach for maximum pain and slow death. Justine howled as she saw Martin collapse to the ground and tried to stop the bleeding, screaming for an ambulance. Pierre fled the scene but didn't get far as police found him within an hour of Justine telling them who the shooter was. He was taken to surgery and the bullet was removed, but they could not stop the bleeding. Three hours later, the surgeon came out and told Justine that everything was on edge. With blood transfusions, Martin returned to consciousness where Justine could be with him for what turned out to be their last time together. She held him and kissed him tenderly, whispering in his ear, I love you so much. Please don't leave. I can't live without you. I've waited a year to get you back, and I won't let you leave me again. Martin opened his eyes, smiled, and with the strength that remained to him, whispered, I love you too, Justine. When their eyes met, she felt her heart break, knowing that the only man she had ever loved was going to leave. In her mind, it was all her fault. 
and the guilt was tearing her apart from the inside. She kissed his lips and hugged him as tears rolled down her face. The last thing Martin remembered before leaving was the taste of her sweet lips and her warm tears on his face. The only good thing about that day was that Martin left with a smile on his face and was completely calm. When she broke the kiss, she realized that he was gone. Her man, her love, her rock, her reason for living had just left. She collapsed on top of him, hugging him and sobbing uncontrollably as her father stood nearby, stroking her shoulder. She screamed, Marty, I'm so sorry. I love you so much. Please forgive me. I will always love you, honey. She couldn't let him go, and there wasn't a dry eye in the room. After a few minutes, two nurses pulled her away from Martin and gave her a sedative to calm her down. Six months after the funeral and after a long public trial, Pierre was found guilty of first-degree murder. Because it was premeditated, he was given a life sentence. The state wanted the death penalty, but the judge rejected the request. All the luxury and fame he once enjoyed was now a thing of the past, and he would spend the rest of his days in prison laundry with only one hour of fresh air a day. Because of his arrogance and sending that photo to Martin, his wonderful life turned into a living hell. The media and Hollywood turned their backs on him and his antics, and they all withdrew any support he had previously enjoyed. Peter, Martin's father, died a month after his son was killed. The weight of this terrible event took its toll on the old man. Peter's wife, Millie, lived another five years and ensured that her husband's business and legacy would continue to exist. She sold the business to employees, making sure the company would thrive after she left. Immediately after Martin's death, Justine sold the house and moved into Martin's apartment, which gave her some sense of closeness to the man who lost his life due to the events of that fateful weekend. Justine turned over her dance business to Carmela and spent the next five years as a recluse, grieving her loss and the events that led to such chaos. She cursed Pierre for ruining her life twice, and the only time she smiled was the moment she learned of his death in prison. Love sometimes comes like a dream and goes away like a nightmare. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one. Listening to the next one.